outside of any cases in North Carolina's the artists and dreamers. We are proud of what makes life worth living Hello, welcome. This is Here Comes the Weirdo Parade. Another week, another weirdo. I have with me Paul Draper, one of the more joyful uh, weirdos uh, I know. Paul, could you briefly introduce yourself to the nice people? I am a anthropologist, musical theater actor, turned mentalist magician, uh, who's now going back to teaching again. But that's uh, that's uh, who uh, I, I'm a fan of the uh, fan X's, the Comic Cons, the Anime Expos, the Ren Fairs, the LARPing, the all of the uh, the fun uh, uh, things that stick us in weirdo camp. In addition to being kind of a geek, uh, are are there some other other ways you're a bit or have been growing up, perhaps a bit of an outsider? You know, I mean that that uh, that's how it all starts, isn't it? I mean. I was a Jewish kid growing up in uh, LDS Mormon uh, uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Utah, uh, and I was the one. Uh, I was also an only child of a single mother, which also uh, puts you, you know, on the outside in a lot of places in society growing up in the 70s and 80s uh, uh, in uh, in a very, uh, you know, in the community that I grew up in. And so it was very difficult to find friends growing up. My friend group tended to be the kid, the, the, the Persian kid and the Methodist kid and the Lutheran kid and the Samoan kid and the Tongan kid and, you know, and, and others who were willing to break the rules in order to be friends with me. Uh, there was a, there was a local religious leader who told all the kids, don't hang out with anybody who's not, you know, just like us. Uh, uh, otherwise you'll end up, uh, you know, marrying someone who's, uh, who will make it so you can't go to heaven? So you know, I mean, so it was uh, that that really put me in that in that group for a while. My group of friends even called ourselves not the weirdos or the geeks, but the outcasts. We were the outcasts, and we even had a T-shirt that said "outcasts," and that was uh, that was part of our our group identity for a bit. Uh, it is a recurring theme in these talks that weirdos tend to find each other. Um, yeah, because because weirdos are, are are hungry for like all human beings are hungry for connection and community and and society and and they they tend to be more accepting of each other. The um and Utah as a whole is a bit more homogenous than a, a lot of areas. So, um, I think in some ways it might even be easier to be a weirdo. Not. Not easier to have the existence of being a weirdo, but it's easy to be dumped into that box. So right. things that aren't weird in other places are weird here. Right, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I was the only Jewish kid in my grade school, junior high, high school, college. Uh, and then when I finally went to Las Vegas, one in ten kids was Jewish. Being Jewish was not strange anymore. I mean, there were... There were more, there were more, uh, synagogues on, uh, on my block than in the entire state I grew up in. You know, I mean, there was a real, a real difference there. When I was little, being someone interested in musical theater made you a really strange person. And, uh, uh this is long before the, the TV shows came out, a uh, glee, where suddenly it became popular to like musical theater. But right. I remember the first time uh, I went to uh, Vegas with my best buddy. About, we went to, after uh, after high school ended as our graduation party. We got in his car and drove to Las Vegas. That was our graduation trip, uh, you know, six hours away. And there was a little uh, space in Caesar's Palace where there was a magic shop right next to a Jewish deli it was decorated with musical theater posters. And uh, I looked at that. And the existence, the fact that there was a place in the world where there was a magic shop next to a Jewish deli with musical theater posters said to me that I could exist in this world. And, uh, and I really think those two shops sitting next to each other in the Forum Shop Mall 
is why I moved to Vegas and lived there full time for 16 years. Do you think, um, I, I know being an artist in general often dumps someone in, into the weirdo box. Um, the, the box does not have hard edges, though. It's very fuzzy. Um, do you think weirdos are drawn to performing arts? Or does it perhaps go the other way around? The people who are drawn to the performing arts tend to become outcast or, or outsider. Look, so, somebody becomes uh, a, a, a police officer because they like doing violence and they like having power uh, and authority. Someone, uh, because not everybody, but there's, there's a percentage. Um, so, someone becomes a... Uh, psychiatrist because they're they like drugs and they like knowing what they can do to us both for good and bad ill and, and the side someone becomes an anthropologist because they want to know how they themselves fit into society i don't i don't fit in and how do i fit in and how do people fit in and are there is there a normal or is is everything unique um uh, uh the arts have been a bastion a place where where the where the walls become soft and and windows and doors open and allow people in and so so if i was to go um like here's here's a story as a child i applied to work at a at a frozen custard restaurant uh and they said to me what ward do you go to which is a name for a uh, latter-day saints church uh, and I said, I don't. I'm Jewish. You know, I mean, the actual joke I used to say all the time is, I don't go to ward. I go to temple. And they say, you go to the temple? And I say, yeah, temple Beth Shalom. You know, I mean, that's the, that's the gag. But it's, but, but I would, they would not hire me because I wasn't a member of the majority religion. I would go other places and they wouldn't hire me because I had long hair. Uh, or they wouldn't hire me. I remember I was hired to speak at a university in Utah once. And when they, just before the internet, before they saw a picture of me, they just had my curriculum vita. And when I showed up in person and they saw that I had a beard, it was against the honor code and they, they released me. They didn't let me speak. Uh, and so, uh, and, and yet when I would go to places in the arts, uh, they would let me in. I mean, they would, they would give me money for food. They would let me be a part of what they were creating. So, so certainly I think, um, in places where there there is a very clear majority with very clear power and a very clear sense of uh, of dominance and control, like holding on to sand in a fist, uh, I think that the um, that the the arts are a are a safe place, but a necessary place. It's why it's why you know why is Broadway you know the famous song from Spamalot? You can't succeed on Broadway if you don't have any Jews. Uh, you, uh, you, it's, uh, everybody, you know, for a long time, uh, every third person in a Broadway show was either Jewish gay or Jewish and gay, uh, because it was a place you could be. Part of my background in performing arts is, um, a, a revival of vaudeville. And historically, vaudeville was the only place some people could make a living. Uh, and the only place that was integrated, um, and, and in all ways, you know, men and women, rich and poor, as, as well as people of color and white people. Um, and some of what they had to do to make a living was a bit degrading, uh, and stuff that won't, wouldn't fly now, but it was often the only, the only way to get any recognition, um, and, uh, yeah, uh, often, as you say, pe people were um, denied jobs and a place in the so society for being Jewish, uh, for being black, for being gay or camp or effeminate, um, male or or bossy female, um, and uh, I think I think there's some some glory in that. There's some some wonderful. Uh, truth to that, that the arts, that the performing arts can be a place for the outsider. Um, and I imagine uh, back then, just as now, the, the, the tech and crew were also outsider. Sure. And the, 
And you know, you if you're an outsider, you have spent your whole life uh, acting like you're not. You know, mm-hmm. trying to pretend like you're not. So you, so the idea of putting on that face or putting on that act is not so unusual of an experience. I mean, you you have a head start as an actor. The first, like you're saying, people that are outsiders, the first sort of national celebrity in America that was non military or political was a fellow named Richard Potter, uh, who was black. And this is in the 1700s. And he, and he was, uh, um, there's a whole little city named after him called Potter's Place. And, uh, and he would do ventriloquism and dancing and magic tricks and, uh, freak show stunts. And he even performed in the deep South, uh, uh, the slave South, right? Slave holding South, horrible. Um, and human holding south when, as a black man, a free black man, performed shows. I mean, it reminds me of, I was talking to actor Ben Vereen, who was famous for uh, Godspell and Pippin and all these shows, uh, and he was touring with Sammy Davis Jr. when he was younger. And he said that uh, one time Sammy was performing on stage, he finished his two-hour show, uh, and he said to the audience, uh, do you all have anywhere else to go? And they said, no. And he said, do you mind if we stay a little longer? And they said, yes. And so he continued for another couple of hours, singing and dancing and gun spinning and doing impersonations and telling jokes and all of this. And afterwards, uh, Ben Vereen said to him, why, you know, why did you do another two hours? He said, well, we're not allowed to go to the restaurants here. We're not allowed to go to the theaters here. We're not allowed to go anywhere. The second we step off stage, we have to go out the back door up to, you know, over to another building to our, you know, room on the green list. And, uh, and, uh, uh, so I'd rather be on stage. Um, and that, uh, you know, even in, in Salt Lake City, Utah, there was a club up by the University of Utah that was, uh, the Fort Douglas Club, and it was no Jews or blacks allowed. And the African American community protested, and the Jewish community bought it and turned it into the Jewish Community Center, and now has events for everybody. Uh, but but that's uh, you know that's that's one of the ways you know we can in Fiddler on the Roof, the most beloved Jewish show of all time. They you know the they make the statement. We have professions we can carry on our back. You know, I can carry a fiddle. I can't carry a drum kit. Uh, I can carry uh, uh, being a doctor. I can carry being a lawyer. But I can't carry being a farmer, because if I'm not allowed to own land, it's over. And so a lot of uh, outcasts and outsiders have chosen professions of the mind and professions of the body because these are professions that they can carry on their back. And uh, do you, does this continue to be true even into the 21st century? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, modern uh, people that, uh, that are outcasts or fleeing or immigrants to new countries, they have to have professions they can carry on their body or carry on their back. Uh, and very often that means laborers. Uh, very often that means, uh, you know, um, you know, unsavory jobs that they may not otherwise want. Uh, but when you can't, when you can't own a factory and you can't own machinery and you can't have the the things, you have to do the things you can physically do, and you have to build community where you can build it. Um, and that's uh, because humans are. Uh, a social uh, creature. I mean, you can't have a uh, uh, you can't ride a rhino into battle because rhinos aren't pack animals. Uh, but you can ride a a uh, they're not social. They don't ha- they don't build hierarchy and community. But you can ride a uh, uh, elephant into battle because they are social and they do build community. And humans uh, in in this line are social creatures. The reason we beat out Neanderthal was because we were better at gathering together in very large groups with big hierarchy uh, and and uh, dropping rocks on Neanderthal. Uh, they were stronger than us. They were faster than us. 
but we were better at building large communities. There's um, been uh, some archaeological uh, evidence that that community building included taking care of disabled people and wounded people. Right. Um, That's yeah. There's the, there's absolutely argument that when does civilization start? The second we start healing the bones of the people that are hurt and not just letting them die. Yeah. And related, I, I think in a lot of cultures, correct me if I'm wrong, at least outside of the, the West, outside of Europe, um, sometimes the weirdos and outsiders have kind of a place of power. <laughs> right. A place of respect. Right, sure. That's it. So, so if we're going to, uh, if we're going to, uh, pre industrial, uh, indigenous societies, uh, you have, you have, very often one individual who is the medicine person, the doctor, the psychiatrist, the therapist, the storyteller, the dance instructor, the song leader, uh, the, uh, the historian, that's all one person in the community. Uh, and all of that is, you know, in, in larger societies, we, we start to uh, break that apart into greater specialization. And that's why we suddenly get doctors who don't have any bedside manner and can't tell a story or communicate with you or listen to you or have any compassion because all they do is doctor. That is it. They, they observe, diagnose, and prescribe the end. Room to room. Observe, diagnose, prescribe, observe, diagnose, prescribe with no kindness or compassion. Um, where, where in smaller society, uh, one person has to wear many hats. And, and we found over and over again that that one that that one of those one person uh, tends to be the the sort of doctor actor singer storyteller uh, therapist as a as a person and and even more interesting though rare is it's very rarely a woman but when but when this person is a woman uh, all over the world they tend to be seen as more powerful smarter more uh, you know stronger. Um, uh, you also see a lot of, uh, uh, two soul people in indigenous society where, where they, they, uh, they are, uh, genderless or gender fluid, uh, and that's, uh, and that's not a problem at all, right? I, I think a lot of modern weirdos, when they learn that, have, have, have a real sense of longing because, um, the, I mean, gosh, I mean, it, it, even if if all you have is is a limp or something, you know, you're you're othered uh, to some extent, and you don't get the option now to live in a hut on the edge of uh, town, where people come around and and ask you for herbs or advice or, or whatever. But even in medieval England, we had uh, we had the uh, um, what is it the the garden hermits uh, mm. that it was quite fashionable. To, to have a, a uh, an old person or a person with a disability or, or somebody that needs to be cared for in society who lives in a, hu- a house on your land and is sort of part security guard, part uh, gardener, part, you know, this person you take care of uh, who is your garden hermit. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, or, or even biblically in the Old Testament, it talks about don't glean your field that you're not supposed to use the food on the edge of your field so that the stranger or the wanderer or the homeless uh, have that food for free, have access to that as they walk down the path from town to town. Um, but yes, as we grow into a larger and larger and larger society, we even, uh, uh, that specialization even goes from, you know, in tiny society, we take care of everybody. In larger society, we create rules to take care of everybody. In larger, larger society, we marginalize, set aside, and put specialists who, who may not necessarily be good at it to be in charge of taking care of the other. And by taking care of, it might be uh, like happened in Utah during the 2002 Olympics, uh, give them a one-way bus ticket anywhere other than here. Um, and so it's... Uh, 
Uh, yeah, as we grow in society, because our brains, again, you've heard me talk about the Dunbar number, our brains can only cope with 3,000 to 5,000 people. So if there's more than three to 5,000 people in our society, then we, we are very picky about who gets to be in and who we say, nope, I ignore you. You are not a person. And that's something homeless populations talk about a lot is, is how they are ignored and their, uh, their existence is, uh, Neil Gaiman even wrote that story about the, a secret population. Neverwhere. Neverwhere. Right. That we're ignored. Um, and that's what we do. We, we stop. We stop seeing people, we other them, to such a degree that they no longer exist, even when we're in the same room or same hallway. Completely invisible. Yeah. All that being said, in 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 the now, are there some benefits to being a weirdo? Are there some uh empowerments to being an outsider i mean eat you i mean you mentioned you're growing up but even now you're you're not a typical american you yeah. know in a lot of ways yeah, yeah, yeah. um yeah. what are some of the pluses of being a weirdo huge plus uh because you are on the edge of multiple societies so like a venn diagram you can see into other realms and other spaces and so so if you're on if you're dead center in your culture all you see is your culture and so everything outside of your culture seems weird and disturbing and you don't understand it. If you're on the edge of one culture and on the edge of another culture, you can peer into both and you have a different perspective, a different perspective in ways of being and in your place in the world. I, I see a lot of people uh, as the world changes from, from what they knew as children to where it's moving in the future, they become very angry because because they don't want they don't understand that no 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 things change you know the these these movies are not made for you they're made for the people who are now 20. these songs are not made for you they're made for the people who are now 20. uh and uh, and that and so so being a person who nothing was ever made for me uh it uh, it makes me more adaptable to change uh, I see all these people who, who are not adaptable to change or the people who were born very beautiful. Everyone was always so nice to them. And then one day they suddenly, the world becomes harsh and cold and they didn't change. They themselves didn't change. They didn't do anything differently, but they're so confused because in the past they were given free tickets to movies. They were given free dinners. They were given free entrance into clubs. They were given, you know, people would rush to them to do nice things to them. And they believe that that's just the way the world was. That was how everybody was treated. But then one day it just stops happening. And, and suddenly the world is a mean place. Well, for someone who didn't have that pretty privilege, uh, they, they, uh, that never, <laughs> that experience never happened to them. And so it's not as frightening when things change. You know, it's not as frightening when, you know, when you, when you go through life, but you find, you know, other paths and other ways. So, so I think there's great benefit to always being on the cusp of cultures, um, and, and with your foot in many cultures and ideas to be a person of the world, uh, to travel, to, to see places. And if you can't travel because of money, you can always travel by book. Uh, in, uh, in libraries with free resources or travel by, uh, travel on the computer. I mean, I had a, I had a lovely vacation yesterday, uh, looking at, uh, reviews of all the studio tours in Hollywood. I didn't have the money this week to go to all the tours, uh, studio tours in Hollywood, but I instead had a vacation on the internet. And again, I, I have the privilege of having a computer and the internet and all these things. But, but there are some of these resources available at public libraries and other public institutions uh, for those that can access them. But, the, uh, but yes, being a person on the cusp of many societies, many cultures, many traditions, many time periods, many artistic uh, uh, ways of thinking um, makes you more adaptable to the world. 
I think um, another uh, benefit or, or power of being an outsider uh, is that if the default model doesn't fit us, then we're not going to move in the default direction. So, um, for example, growing up gay, I can't look at my parents and say, this is what a relationship looks like, because it's not going to look like that for me. So I'm not going to sort of accidentally become my parents. I've, I've got to figure it out for myself. Um, and I think that's harder, but I think there's a lot of benefit to having to figure it out for yourself. And, and the same goes for um, other axes of, of, of weirdness. The You can't just go through life and do what your dad did. You can't just go through life and uh, follow the standard expected pattern uh, and then wind up where you're expected to be and may maybe be completely miserable. You, you've you got to sort of make your own way, which, as I say, it, it can be a lot harder, but it can be more satisfying. It can get you in places you normally couldn't get. You know, there are lots of people I've met who are fifth-generation shoemakers or, you know, or fifth-generation, uh, uh, you know, cobblers or the same thing, fifth-generation, uh, uh, you know, uh, the horseshoers, you know, the, uh, um, uh, the farriers. Is it a farrier? Yeah, farrier. Yeah. So the, uh, but you, uh, uh, and, and the nice thing about those jobs is you, you, you don't have to sort of, uh, spend time with the anxiety of, oh no, what am I going to do? How am I going to learn it? Will I get a job? What do I charge? Uh, you know, fifth generation doctor, fifth generation lawyer, you know, you, you, you sort of, uh, uh, know what the path is. You know, I, I certainly know lots of people who their dad was a CPA, they're a CPA, their son's a CPA. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, uh, but they lose, like you said, the benefit of, of their brain becoming more wrinkly, uh, and finding new connections, new pathways and new, new ways of thinking that help them to, to do other things. I mean, the, the great entrepreneurial spirit of America uh, uh, didn't also spring forth from the European individuals who didn't come to America. If right. you if you were a person who made the journey uh, across the ocean to start a new life, your brain had to change to cope with that uh, in a way that people who uh, uh, didn't come across didn't. And so this entrepreneurial American experience, uh, as Ben Franklin so quaintly put it, we are a different people. We are we are bolder, quicker to anger, more entrepreneurial, more you know outdoorsy, more uh, and and just it's not that the the air or the water made them a different kind of people. It was it was in the act of making a different choice of setting forth a different path of, of that adventure, it created a different kind of people. Um, and, you know, not to say the people in England are worse off, but they are, in many ways, less dynamically entrepreneurial. Less, uh, uh, and not every individual, but less and less uh, aggressively individualistic and less... Um, uh, uh, boisterous and outgoing as, as our American compatriots. And I'm not saying those are good things, but they are different things. So, so we as a country started as outsiders, uh, and then, then we have become the norm. But it's, uh, yeah, I think, I think anytime you can move west, uh, either, either physically or in your mind or in your profession to continue that journey, not of, uh, not of taking land from those who were there before, but in starting a new experience and, and uh, starting fresh, a fresh start. I think any fresh start does make you a more dynamic, interesting person uh, if you survive that pain. There, there's definitely part of the American mythos of I'm going to make my own way. You know, I'm going to I'm going to bust out of here and, and do my thing and I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be big. Um the it, which which is interesting because in reality, 
that's not really what our culture supports, but we do love a story about an underdog making it. You know, uh, that's really interesting. The core of the hero myth is, I love the story of the hero because I don't want to be him or her or them. I don't, I don't want to, I'm not willing to sacrifice uh, what they sacrificed in order to be a hero, but wow, it's neat that they are. Yeah. Well, uh, that's uh, pretty close to our time. Uh, do you have any advice or words of wisdom for, for young weirdos growing up and feeling lost in the world? Or, or perhaps something your, your younger self would have liked to have known? When your strange faces come out... Um, the, uh, the, uh, the big thing that I wish I would have understood... Um, is the world's a really big place. There are billions of people, and and there are there are people like you in the world, and that have struggled with the same struggles that you are facing. Maybe not exactly, but close. And and they exist, and they are willing to talk to you uh, if you approach them in a way that isn't terrifying. Um, everyone needs lunch, right? If you offer to buy someone lunch, they will talk to you, right? Over over lunch. If you if you uh, um, if you offer to pay somebody a uh, hundred dollars to talk to you on Zoom uh, for fifteen minutes, they will. Uh, you know whoever it is, and uh, and most people who are very successful once they hear your story will give you your hundred bucks back. You know, I remember there was someone a famous mentalist. I desperately wanted to meet, and I did exactly that. I offered to buy him a meal, and then uh, he said, okay. We went out for the meal, and then he paid for both of our meals um, and said to me, in exchange for this, it's your job. One day when a young person comes up to you and asks for advice, you buy them a meal. I have purchased hundreds of meals uh, because of that deal. So, um, so there are people out there. And, and don't, don't have an ex, they don't owe you anything. Don't have an expectation that they must or, or that they're the one. I, I mean, I once found an individual who taught, uh, who studied Middle East anthropology like I do. And he was a bass opera singer like I am. And he was Jewish like I am. Uh, and he was the head of a performance studies program like I wanted to be. And the guy was nasty to me and wanted nothing to do with me. But, but, uh, I did find other people who were in musical theater, who were magicians, who were in performance studies, who were in anthropology, who have been unbelievably kind to me. So don't hang your hat on one individual, but realize that there are people out there waiting to meet you. Uh, and if you can, um, have an act of service or a kindness or support a charity they support or, uh, or, or engage with them in some positive, kind way, that you can build a friendship that might turn into a mentorship that can help build community and society for you. And, and uh, uh, you are five degrees of separation from anybody on the planet. You just have to talk to people and tell them. You know, the, the, uh, the fellow uh, who invented Siri, Adam Shire, he said one of the most powerful things he ever learned was make your dreams known, speak them into existence, tell them to everyone, and eventually someone will say, oh, I know someone who can help you. So that's that's my advice. There are people out there for you. And may each of us find our magic shop next to the deli. <laughs> um, that's... Uh, you know, and I, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm, I'm kind of there now. Uh, you know, I... Uh, I do broadcast media and performing and vaudeville, and I found a theater that does live streaming, which is broadcasting, uh, and lets me produce the shows. I find weirdos. I, I've, I've got the freedom to try out this sort of experiment of the podcast. Um, we just, I mean, our very first episode just aired today, so I, I don't really have a lot of feedback yet. Um, but, uh, oddly enough, I've had a lot of people really enjoy the the interview portion and and really i'm mostly just letting people talk about themselves uh but 
uh, it's always lovely talking to you. Good talking uh, to you. And uh, this has been Here Comes the Weirdo Parade. Tune in next week for whoever we talk to. Thank you. Let me have the blindfold from you. Excellent. Any electronics or weirdness in this? No. No. Okay. Now, if you would, there are two blank sheets of paper over there. If you would grab two black markers and the two sheets of paper, each of you will take one of the sheets of paper. I would like you to draw a picture that if I was to show it to everyone, they would know what it is. But don't draw a pig. I'm going to listen to you to try and figure out what you're drawing. So come close if you would, begin drawing now. She drew a circle. He hasn't started. He drew a half moon shape. She's drawing straight lines, kind of half moon shape lines. He's drawing straight lines. He's drawing all straight lines. This is amazing. There is a connection between these two that you don't even understand yet. They don't even know yet, don't look. But this is great. I want, I, I almost think they had the same kindergarten teacher. <laughs> no, this is, this is incredible. Are you, are you almost done? Okay, place yours in my hand so the audience can see it. Yeah, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> I would say those are very close. <laughs> But I do want to discuss the slight artistic differences. Both of them have drawn, drawn houses. Both of them have drawn houses with pointy roofs. There is a difference though. Hers is in the summer and his is in the winter. Do you know how I can tell? Because she has grass and he has smoke coming out of the chimney. <laughs> Here comes the Weirdo Parade, which is a production of Skixie's Greater Shows. That's Skixie with two X's, skixiesgreatershows.com to check out more. Our theme song, Here Comes the Weirdo Parade, is a production of the Whistling Swans, and copyright them. The opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the producers, but are edited to accurately represent the conversation with the guest or guests. We hope you will tune in next week. Here comes the Weirdo Parade airs every Monday at 2 p.m. Mountain Time. You can help support this podcast and other Skixie's Greater Show productions by going to patreon.com forward slash skixual. That's forward slash S-C-I-X-U-A-L. Again, that is patreon.com forward slash skixual, and there are benefits to dedicating even one dollar per month, including getting these episodes a week early. Well, that's a look.